Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Now, for a long time, you guys have heard me talk about an ending to a certain movie that completely changed my life and how I got grounded for the first time from talking about horror movies because of this movie. Well, that wouldn't have happened without its brainchild. Today, I am joined by the amazing Adam Marcus. Adam, how are you doing today, man? I'm good, brother. I'm good. Great to be here, man. Oh, dude, this is such an honor for me. Uh, for those of you that don't know, if you haven't uh, heard me talk about it before, um, Adam was on he wrote and directed jason goes to hell at a very young age and at the end of that movie spoiler alert um you get to see freddie's glove come from the ground and grab jason's mask and take it down to hell and seeing freddie a uh, freddie glove in a jason movie at such a young age to me really really was such an amazing experience so um what was it like concocting that movie and you also had the necronomicon in the movie a little bit what was sure it did. like being a part of all that Wow. Uh, overwhelming and awesome. And I think, uh, you know, look, I was very enthusiastic. I had been in the business a long time, even though uh, I directed the movie when I was 23 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd been around filmmaking my whole life and I'd been around uh, Broadway performance and, and, and all of that stuff. So uh, I think I was too young and maybe a little too stupid to realize like how overwhelming it actually was. Um, I was really at ease working, you know, as the guy who led a hundred plus person crew every day. Like that didn't seem weird to me for some reason. And, sure. you know, look, I, I started my own theater company when I was 15 years old um, and I started teaching around that time. So I really, you know, I joke that like as a teenager, I was already middle aged. Um, so <laughs> so like I, it, none of it, none of it ever really threw me that much. But I will say there was something marvelous and freeing about the idea that, you know, I was honoring these men who had meant so much to me growing up, these filmmakers, these voices that had meant so much to me. You know, Sean Cunningham was like a second, a second father to me. Um, uh, maybe, you know, a slightly abusive father, but a father nonetheless. Uh, and then, you know, Wes Craven was Uncle Wes, mm -hmm. you know, and he was just a fixture. He was part of that whole world. Um, as was Steve Miner, which you and I were, were briefly discussing before we started the show. And, and you have the house poster behind you, which I worked on ever so briefly. Um, and, you know, so, uh, so I was surrounded by these remarkable people. And then, and then Sam Raimi, who was, you know, kind of my teenage crush uh, as a filmmaker, you know, the, the Evil Dead was like a huge deal to me. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I asked him if I could have the Necronomicon to put in the film, the fact that not only did he say yes, but then he like threw it in a Ziploc bag and handed it to K and B, like, give it to Adam, all set. Um, you know, like it 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 demystified movie making to me. It 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 mm -hmm. made everything seem so obtainable and and so like everybody in our industry, we're all just people. We're just people. And, you know, and we have egos and we get upset the same way everybody else does. And yeah. You know, we just happen to make movies, but th that's the only dividing line. That's the only thing that's different. And the minute that 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 got demystified for me at a very young age, uh, the overwhelming nature of making Jason Goes to Hell went away pretty quickly. And it was more about just like, I want to make a kick ass movie. I just want to make something that I as a fan would love to go see. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so. And what I, what I love about it is that movie shows that this takes place in the same universe as the evil dead. This takes place in the same universe as a nightmare on Elm street, you know, and you can also make the argument that perhaps Jason is the most powerful deadite of all time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And look, you know, I know that there's a lot of people who get upset when, when they hear deadite because there's, there's a certain um, ideology behind that and a, and a certain amount of rules which I always laugh at people who talk about the rules of the Necronomicon. You know, the only right Necronomicon is the evil dead. I'm like, no, it's not. Stop it. There's a lot right. of Necronomicons. You know, if you, if you love H.P. Lovecraft, you know that there's not one book of the dead. That's all nonsense. And there are different forms of deadite, whether it's a revenant, um, you know, th there's, there's different areas. And for us, what I loved about it and what I love about, about the, the, the uh, mythology we created around Jason, because we didn't change Jason. We did. Sure. We just added to what was already a legendary, you know, child turned monster turned zombie. Because um, remember, Jason had already gone through a lot of transitions up till yep. part nine. 
So when I got my hands on him, it was like, you know what? Um, I want to attach him uh, to other mythologies. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and putting him in the Evil Dead made me go, okay, now Jason is Hell's assassin. Yeah. And I'm sorry, like there's nothing cooler than your villain being Hell's assassin. So sure. yeah, it, it, was, it was giving a little more mythology and a little more fun for me, for the character. Um, you know, Tommy McLaughlin turned him into, uh, you know, this Frankenstein monsters zombie. And Tommy, by the way, best guy ever. Uh, uh, Tommy and I um, were friends and, and he knows how much I adore part six. It's my favorite of all the movies. Right. Um, it really always has been. It's like, I, you know, and, and honestly, I find for me, Jason Goes to Hell, for me, is a sequel to part six. Like, that's okay. the one that I really attach myself to not just from the standpoint of what Tom did with the, with the character, but also just from a cinematic standpoint, what I love about part six is there's this beautiful sense of humor. Um, mm -hmm. There's a certain nod and a wink. It knows what it's doing. And so for me, it, creatively, Jason Goes to Hell is the, is the sequel to part six. Um, sure. Even though we, we, actually, we actually follow part seven, which was my mandate uh, in making the movie. But yeah, man. Um, I, I, you know, when I was a little boy, uh, I was a big Scooby-Doo fan. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that, you know, Scooby-Doo knew Batman and there was the yeah. Batman episode of Scooby-Doo, I was like, my little mind was blown. My eight-year-old <laughs> brain like almost fell out of my head. And then like two weeks later, the Harlem Globetrotters showed up. <laughs> and I was like, what? They know everybody, you know? Right. So for me... When I when I was uh, tackling Jason, it was how do we, how do I make the universe of all my favorite horror icons one big universe? How do we how do we bring everybody together? Uh, and that's what Jason uh, goes to hell ended up being. It was like a giant Scooby Doo episode. Well, and you also created fucking Creighton Duke, man. Like, come on, like one of the best you know side characters in the whole Friday the Thirteenth mythology. You. Thank you, brother. You know, Thank you. Like he's one that we always remember. We always talk about Creighton too, because he's such a badass man. And you yes. know, I, yes. I have a huge, huge soft spot for Jason Goes to Hell. Everybody that knows me knows that because I'm not bullshit you. I got grounded from talking about horror movies because I my mom got so tired. She's like, I swear to God, if I hear you talk about fucking Freddie and Jason one more time, I'll say, Bob, you don't get it. <laughs> like, you don't understand what this has done to me. Like this has turned my world That's upside amazing, down. Like, dude. That is amazing. <laughs> So look, it's I, so I gotta, cool, man. I gotta tell you, dude. Uh, look, I mean, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. Um, and and I will say, when it comes to Creighton Duke, you know, uh, what's awesome about Creighton Duke is that he really was. Um, he was so outside the studio, so outside Sean Cunningham. Sean really had nothing to do with Creighton. Um, Sean, uh, the, the 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 trick about about Creighton Duke was that Dean Laurie and I are both ridiculous Jaws fans, like mm -hmm. stupid Jaws fans. We wanted to put uh, Quint in our movie. We, it's one of our favorite characters. I've written like six different versions of Quint. I know Dean <laughs> has as well. So the two of us were like, how do we get a Quint style hunter? You know, how do we get Ahab in this movie? And yeah. Creighton was what was spawned out of that. What's beautiful about that is that the initial casting for Creighton um, changed uh, because there, there was a wonderful Broadway actor, John Rubenstein, who was going to play the part, who had done all the readings of the piece and, and all that. And his agent, John is a, you know, he's a, a Tony Award winning actor. He's an amazing actor. Uh, his agent in the, in the 11th hour went, oh, no, I'm not letting you actually be in a Friday the 13th movie. That's not happening. And pulled him out of the movie, um, which was heartbreaking because, you know, John Rubenstein was one of my one of my heroes when I was a really little kid. I, I saw him uh, in, in his first big hit on Broadway in Pippin. He played the lead. He played Pippin. Yeah. And so, uh, so that broke my heart. So uh, my casting directors, Barry Moss, God, uh, God rest his soul, and uh, David Giella came to me and were like, hey, what do you think about going black with the character? And I was like, I think that sounds awesome. Who do you think, who are you thinking about? Right. So initially we were talking about Yafet Kodo, but mm -hmm. uh, New Line would not allow it because he had just done Freddy's Dead. 
Yeah. So they wouldn't allow us to cross the streams that way. So it's like, OK, I got it. Got it. Um, what's amazing is they brought in a few actors for me to meet. All brilliant. One of those actors was Tony Todd, uh, who was incredible. But he wasn't Creighton. It, it, right. Tony is Tony is such a gentleman. He's just a remarkable actor. But he wasn't Creighton. There wasn't that sense of um, sadism that Creighton sure. needed. There's, there's that, again, that Quint thing, that, that like getting under your skin kind of guy. And truly, Stephen Williams came in to meet me. We shook hands. He was about three lines into the dialogue. I turned to my, my cast directors and went, that's great. That's him. That's, that's it. That's the guy. <laughs> like, that's the it, one right there. You, you, like th those magical moments when an actor just is the person that you were thinking of the whole time. And again, it's not what we were thinking about when we wrote it, but when he walked in, <clears throat> suddenly it's like, uh, it, it, it's like Creighton filled with, flesh and blood and a voice yeah. and uh, and steven has this unbelievable sense of perversity that is like amazing he's hilarious mm -hmm. and um his eyes like they just find this way behind your eyes and kind of hook you and mm -hmm. uh and i was like he's the dude like this is it he's he he is the duke he is the duke that's this is right. the guy. and so what's great about creighton is that there, there really are three fathers of Creighton. It's Dean, myself, and then Stephen Williams, who, who's just, he just is the Duke. And what's awesome is that I am right now, actively right now, writing the, uh, the Creighton Duke inspired film that Stephen and I are doing together. So we yeah. are working on a movie together uh, that will be, you know, Creighton Duke inspired. Um, and, uh, it's pretty exciting. So yeah, 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 yeah. Creighton, Creighton will, will ride again. Cool. That sounds fun. You, when, when we're done live, I want to talk to you a little more about that. I don't want to put you any of that in the airways. Absolutely. Yet, but, uh, I get it. Absolutely. Um, but you know what? We're talking a lot about Friday the 13th part yeah. nine, Jason goes to hell because of how much of an influence I had on me, man. But we can't sell you short. You've done so much in your That's career. Right. And Thank you. you know, between you and Deborah Sullivan, your writing partner, you guys wrote scripts for Paramount with yep. Virgin, Fox, uh, the original Black Autumn, Lionsgate, you guys, the Texas Chainsaw 3D. Um, and in 95, something else I want to talk about that I think is very special. You created the Skeleton Crew Theater Works. Um, yes, I did. And today, you guys are still training a lot of the talented actors in the industry. And the troupe has really been the backbone of your theatrical and cinematic uh, cast. Now, we're talking about your troupe a little bit. What, what, have you always been attracted to the stage as well? Or is that oh, something yeah. that? Yeah, I, I was trained in, in the theater. That's, that's where all my training came from. And funny enough, what a lot of people don't know is that was Sean Cunningham's training. Sean, Sean was a, um, you know, was a, a cat, uh, sorry, was a um, stage manager for Broadway. So Sean okay. actually stage managed the show Wait Until Dark. Um, on its national theatrical run as well. So, and I believe that's where Sean and Susan first worked together. Susan Cunningham, um, again, God rest her soul, uh, who, who was the editor on, uh, uh, on part two, uh, which is brilliantly edited and also on things like Spring Break. And that's, Susan was the first person to teach me how to edit. Um, awesome. So, so, you know, uh, yeah, I came out of the theater. My whole family, um, most of my family have been on Broadway. My brother Kip, who's in Jason Goes to Hell, was famously on Broadway in Les Miserables as Marius. So That's awesome. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, look, I, I grew up in a, in, in a community in Westport, Connecticut, about 40 miles outside of New York City, uh, which is where Sean actually was born and raised as well. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up in this community that was nothing but these remarkable performers and and theater people i mean neil simon lived in town paul newman lived down the road um i used to sing at martha stewart's house for christmas um and you know i i got to work with people like Kier delay and sandy dennis um and and frank gorshin and these remarkable acting talents that i got to read plays with as a child um look i created a theater company when i was 15 that led me out to to NYU, which helped pay for my 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 schooling at NYU um, in the film school and then out to L.A. where I kept all of that going. Yeah. And 
you know, from the time I was 15 to the time I was 21, I did over 80 plays. That's insane, man. You're still a kid. Yeah. Yeah. But I was, but I was just serious about being a professional. I, you know, I, I had this, um, you know, while Sean was sort of a cinematic father to me, uh, I, I had a, a mentor in school um, named Al Pia, who actually trained my parents when I was too young to know him. Uh, and this is a guy who, when I was 11 years old, and I, it's why I teach to this day. This is the reason why. I was 11 years old. He knew how seriously I wanted to pursue all of this. And he gave me a copy of, of An Actor Prepares, of Stanislavski's text on performance. And at 11 years old, he would send me home. I'd have to read a chapter, come back the next day and talk with him about it and explain what I'd learned. And sure. anything I didn't learn, he would open the book and go through it with me page by page in the text. And I'm 11. Right. And he never treated me like an 11 year old. He treated me like, you want to be a professional, you'll be a professional. And that's the way I'll treat you. And so I was given this incredible respect for the theater, for the theater arts, for actors in specific. Um, but he taught me how to direct. You know, by the time mm -hmm. I was 13, I understood the basics of directing theater. Um, and that's all due to the fact that I was gifted with incredible teachers in my life. I, I also had somebody in college while I was at NYU, I had a guy named Peter Ray who uh, he produced the movie Grandview USA with Patrick Swayze and Jamie Lee Curtis yep. back in the day. Um, and a cast of others that are amazing. It's an amazing cast, <laughs> uh, which was directed by Randall Kleiser. Well, Peter Ray was, you know, was a force to be reckoned with at NYU. And he's the person who really taught me how to produce and what all of that meant. So by the time I had left NYU, I, I had one best picture while I was at NYU in the, in, you know, and, and it's a, uh, you know, I, I was up against 300 films and we won best picture. Uh, but not only that, all of my production texts, all of my books, my production books for that movie ended up being teaching tools, not only at NYU, but at Emerson College in Boston. That's so, so cool, man. Yeah, so, you know, so look, I, again, I don't, I, don't, I don't take any of it on for myself as achievements I've done. That's, that's a mistake. I take it as I was very blessed to have great teachers and people who understood the arts so well. I, I joke that, you know, the people I learned from forgot way more than I've ever learned. You know? And but the fact that you, you're, you're at 11 years old being that sponge to, to know that when these people talk, I need to listen. If I want to be a professional and this is what I want to do, I need to understand what they're saying and I need to really drive my focus onto this. At 11 years old, that's fucking hard. Yeah. You know, well, it was, but again, it was, I knew, I didn't know anything else. You also have to remember, and, and I don't know whether you know this or not, but you know, my, my whole family is in the business, but mm -hmm. my two uncles, uh, my, my uncle Ned, who has always been my hero, um, Ned Eisenberg, if you've ever seen The Burning, he's Eddie. Yeah. He's Eddie in The Burning. Oh, So okay. that's my uncle, right? So he's been a that guy for the last 40 years. Everybody knows, like you show a picture of Ned Eisenberg, you go, oh, I know that guy. You'll never know his name. You know he's that guy, right? Mm -hmm. um, he's, uh, he's one of the most remarkable artists I've ever known. And the fact that I'm related to him is just like a bonus. Then, have you ever seen Don't Go in the House? I have not. Okay. Classic uh, 1981 movie. Don't go in the house. Uh, there's great pictures in Times Square of it playing right next door to Friday the 13th, side by side. Um, it's one of the most famous don't movies. Well, Joe Ellison, the writer, director, producer of the movie, is my other uncle. So, yes. so I had like this, I was somehow like soaked in all of this horror stuff. But also in a sense of, if you want to do this, it's a profession, it's a craft. This idea of being famous, this idea of all that, the trappings that go with being, none of that mattered to me. That's not where my head was at. It right. was always about the work and about storytelling and about how do I get as good at this as I possibly can. Sure. Well, I mean, I can say that you've done that. And the Thanks. good thing about that is this isn't something that's just about the past. I mean, 
through Skeleton Crew here yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, you're actually doing the action thriller Dread and coming this year on um, the television series Mosaic. So, yes. I mean, like, it's not like, and like we talked a little bit ago, the Creighton Duke inspired stuff is coming out. So mm-hmm. it's not like this is I'm, I'm talking to somebody that's, you know, past their prime. You're Thank still you. kicking ass, man. <laughs> Thanks, man. So, Thank you. I yeah, it's one of those things it. where I, I don't want to, you know, make it misleading yeah. that, oh, we're talking to this guy that's already gone past his heyday. You know, for the people that don't know, you're still out there beating ass. Like I said, you're shooting. Are you done with the shoot on um, Dread yet? No, no, no. Dread, we're actually heading down to Louisiana in two months. Um, and the only reason it, it, you know, thank you so much. The only reason it's taken so long is because of COVID. So we, you right. know, we've been we've been dancing through those raindrops. Not only that, but you know, I mean, and it's funny because look, here's the thing: Jason Goes to Hell was my first feature as a writer and director. Okay, it was my very first movie. Now the funny thing is, I had already set up the movie Johnny Zombie, which ended up becoming My Boyfriend's Back at Disney before Jason Goes to Hell, which is how I got Jason Goes to Hell. Everybody always thinks like Sean just handed me a bag of goodies. It's just not true. Right. Um, I came to L.A. I was Sean's slave. Um, I worked on movies like House 4, which you and I discussed. But by the way, prior to that, I had been working for years in New York for R. Greenberg and Associates. So I had worked on Silence Lambs, Goodfellas. Um, I yes. worked very closely with Brian De Palma on... Um, uh, on Bonfire to the Vanities. So I, I had already been doing a lot of stuff. I got to LA and I had this project that Dean and I had been workshopping for years that Dean wrote this brilliant script called Johnny Zombie. And we had set that up. But again, Jason Goes to Hell was the birth of my career. Now, here's sure. the thing. I understand that I will forever be known, especially in the horror community, as Adam, Jason Goes to Hell, Marcus. Like, I get it. It's cool. That's okay with me. I'm, I'm great with that. Um, I'm proud of the movie. I love the fans of that movie. Um, but yeah, it was the opening salvo. And thank you for for recognizing like there's a lot of other stuff. Because a lot of times people in the horror genre, they they tend to only focus on the horror stuff that you do rather than like there's a whole world of stuff that I've that I've done. Um, well, and, something else uh, I wanted to bring up real quick while we're yeah. on the subject. There's 10 yeah, please. seconds. Please. Um, one of my first crushes ever was Misty from My Boyfriend's Back. And, you know, um, and then you also have, oh, now he knocks over the coffee, you yeah. know, like and I'll show you when we're done. Just, so you know, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. Yeah. I still have my boyfriend's back on VHS and me and my kids watched it. And Dude. my daughter, who's nine, could not stop laughing at the part where he's like, oh, what? You just going to eat everybody in my whole family today? Like my daughter laughed at that part for so long, man. That's awesome. We, dude. I, 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 it made it on my top 10 favorite horror comedies of all time. Um, it, it's just, you know, so I go back and I rewatch these movies with my kids and I hold that in my heart up there with idle hands and Shaun of the dead. Thank you. That, oh man, that, that's awesome. That's, that's beautiful company to be in. That's great. That's great. For people that haven't seen my boyfriend's back, like it's this almost meta take on zombies, you know, like, yeah. cause they know like when he rises, he's like, Oh, well this has happened before, mm-hmm. you know, he goes to his house and his parents are like, we're me, the doctors, we're pretty sure you're dead. And he grabs, he's like, I got better. Yeah, <laughs> starts eating like it's such yep. a fantastic movie that's got some genuine laughs. Philip Seymour Hoffman at a very young age is oh, in yeah. this movie. One of his first, you know, like, one of the first things he ever did. Yeah, Matthew McConaughey sitting in the movie theater watching. I mean, like, there's so many good things to notice in this movie when you're watching that you didn't pay attention to back then when you first seen it. So this is a movie that another one I can't say enough good things about because it. I, I don't know if you know this about me, Adam, but. I grew up in a video store. My parents owned a video store. That is awesome. VHS and, you know, NES games were my entire life growing up. And um, my boyfriend's back is one that I got because of the cover art on it. You know, you see this guy in the ground and, you know, you got his uh, tombstone behind him and the girl leaning on the tombstone. Like, Mm -hmm. this is what's going on here. You know, and you go and you watch it. It's comic book influenced as well. You have a lot of the comic excerpts to it. Like, what an amazing film. And I'm glad you brought that up. That's something else I wanted to talk about before we got into the real reason why we're here. But love the film. Never knew it was called, uh, what did you say, Johnny Zombie? Johnny Zombie. That was the original title. Yep. Never yep. knew that. That's brilliant. And by the way, the original title is the reason Sean picked up the movie. Really? Mm-hmm. Dude, and I love that movie. I, like, again, I, I you, can't dude. say enough good things about it because Thank you. There, uh, there's je- – I love – you also have in this movie – one of the best love stories of all time. I mean, and you even have the caretaker saying it. He's like, would you die for her? And the dad's like, of course. 
would you come back to the dead for her? Uh, probably. Would you eat someone just to be with her? And he's like, no, I wouldn't. You know, and you got Johnny laying there dying. Is oh my god, I could talk about this movie all fucking day. Man. So <laughs> that's awesome. It's, just, dude. it's another movie that means so much to me. Like that, that's that little dialogue right there is such a special dialogue to show. By the way, how much this. I'll tell you something really funny that I think you'll dig. Uh, when we when we were first putting that movie together, we were trying to sell it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, we decided that because studio executives tend to never read any scripts. They, they just read like book reports on screenplays. Um, we did readings for the studios. We, we put together these casts. And again, because I had this background and Sean had his, his background in theater and our casting directors were actually Broadway casting directors. Okay. They were New yeah. York guys. Um, they uh, put together casts that had like a number of Tony winners around the table, like Charlotte Ray from the, from the facts of life. Who played Mrs. Garrett? Yeah. She was in our cast. The original Tony Award winning actor from Sweeney Todd, who played Sweeney Todd on Broadway, was in mm-hmm. our cast. And the person who played Johnny Dingle, the first person to play it, the first person to read it at that table, was the guy who lived two doors down from Dean and I the whole time we were at NYU, Adam Sandler. No way. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. Yep. Yep. Adam Sandler which, was the first which, guy to play John. This is not saying anything bad about Sandler because Sandler sure. is a fucking god and he's a he's gentleman awesome. from everything I've heard. He's the nicest he's awesome. guy. He's awesome. That would have easily, easily been my favorite Sandler movie. <laughs> easily. I love <laughs> it. Well, but again, this is before this is this was just after you know Adam had done a run on the Cosby Show, and he was just about to go back to New York to audition for SNL. So it's right okay. before SNL. So he didn't have any clout to get anything made. But our cast directors were like, this kid's really interesting. He's really great. And then they told us Adam Sandler. We're like, yeah, he's been our next door neighbor for three years. Like, we know Adam. Yeah, we, so, we, we're familiar. We got it. Uh, he's funny, dude. So, uh, so yeah, he was the first person to lay Johnny. And that's, that's incredible because, and it's funny, I can't, I can picture Sandler playing the part, mm-hmm. but... Uh, man, the movie's just perfect the way it is. I don't know Thank if I can change anything That's about very it, cool. man. That's very cool. Like, Because even, like, there's little parts of it that we always, like, I still, to this day, like, me and my cousin, like, we'll be uh-huh. eating something, and I'll go to bite his arm. And he's like, dude, you were going to bite me. Like, just a little bit. He's like, no. A little bit. Done. <laughs> so it's definitely one of those movies that, to me, has definitely withstood the test of time. And you can go yeah. back and rewatch it today, and the younger kids don't look at it as, you know, like, there's some movies you watch, and they just don't hold up. Right. This is still funny. Like, it's still right. a very funny movie. Well, I think because so zombie, to watch today. I, I think because zombie culture became such a thing over the last 30 mm-hmm. years, I think now that movie is a little bit ahead of its time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. but the thing about it is it's almost got this, like, like the Burbs type attitude to it, too. Like, yes. when Johnny comes home and the mom's like, I got you something in the fridge. And yep. you walk out there and the little boys and they're like, Mom, what is this? Look at your dinner. <laughs> like, it's just, it's so brilliant and the, uh, we don't want anybody to think ill of us you know like it's just there's so many quotable lines throughout that movie that yeah. i could literally like i said i could talk about this movie all day no, and dean, all night. dean did that, an incredible job with that screenplay really remarkable really did man and yeah. i'm so glad i get to talk to you about these things and um but we spent a lot of time talking about those but i want to talk we know about what you got going on in the future uh with dread and mosaic and oh. some of the things that you've done right now, but Adam, I really want to go back to the past. You no had to help and uh, you, you worked on house. Jason goes to hell. My boyfriend's back. You definitely had these helping hands and shaping my horror life, but I need to know how horror got shaped for you and how it started for you, my friend. So I want to talk about your first horror movie that you ever watched and your first horror movie was. Well, uh, here's the thing. <laughs> the, 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 for me, the first horror movie, because it's it, it, it's conflated with a lot of stuff that happened around it. Um, the, the, the Big Daddies, for me, both came kind of at the same moment um, because Rosemary's Baby uh, and The Exorcist both entered my life around the same time. Um, Rosemary's Baby, most specifically, uh, kind of kicked my ass because my, my parent first. OK, here's the thing. There's a legend that my mother read Rosemary's Baby while she was pregnant with me. <laughs> so, so that explains a lot. Uh, the other thing is my grandmother dated Ira Levin back in the day. 
Um, oh. Yeah, they were friends. So, uh, so there's a weird connection I have to that that movie and that that author. Um, well, we I was about uh, six, and my parents had taken us to DC. We we were on a trip to DC. I don't quite remember what the heck we were doing there, um, but my my brother and I were left in a hotel room while my parents and my grandparents went downstairs to have dinner. Sure. And, uh, you know, which is totally responsible, you know, mid 70s uh, parenting. It's totally the way things went. So there's my five year old brother and I'm six years old and we are, you know, jumping from bed to bed in the in the hotel room because that's what you mm-hmm. do. Of and the, te- the television was on and Rosemary's Baby came on. And it was, I think, the first time it had ever been shown on television. Yeah. Uh, and it it scared the crap out of me i mean it was Mm -hmm. really and you know when you think about a little kid watching a movie that's such a slow burn like that um that's a very adult horror film but i have to tell you like for me that that viewing uh it it, it changed i think it changed the way my brain worked um and, and i gotta say like i'm a huge uh cinephile when it comes to foreign films when it comes to quieter, slower movies, um, even as a little kid, like I would prefer going to see a movie where there were subtitles, which sounds okay. insane because kids usually that's not where their heads go. That movie really put me into that place. Um, yeah. It really put me into the headspace of wanting to see stuff like that. So, uh, look, I was very influenced uh, by by Rosemary's Baby. I, I will say, you know, for me. Um, even back then, God, it's so crazy. The things I, I remember as a kid, I remember there, there's an amazing shot, one of the best in the whole film, and one of the most remarkable story points where uh, Guy, Rosemary's husband, is talking to the next door neighbor and he's in the living room and there's, uh, the, the, the neighbor is smoking. There's a cigarette and there's smoke coming around the door, the door that, that Rosemary is trying to look into the room from the kitchen, but she can't quite see anything. She just sees a leg, a crossed leg, and this smoke coming up. Mm-hmm. And I remember as a kid thinking, what's happening in that room? Like, I wanted to know what was happening in that room, which is exactly what Polanski wants you to feel, right? Right. And I remember trying to look around the door <laughs> from, on the television, like trying to see what was happening in that room. And there was something about that idea about not being able to see what's happening that was so scary to me as a child. Yeah. Um, And and it's funny because I remember a lot of things from my childhood about wanting to know what was happening in a room that I couldn't see fully into that room being very, very frightening for me as a kid. The fear of the unknown, even if it's just in the next room. Exactly. Exactly. Which, by the way, is why... I never took the mask off in Jason Goes to Hell. Fear of the unknown, man. That's why. Because for me, every time, and this was actually something Sean said to me very early on in working together, but he said, once you see the face of fear, it's not scary anymore. Sure. And there's genius in that. So when it came to, like when, you know, when Bob Kurtzman and and Howard Berger and Greg Nicotero and I were all brainstorming and working on on the makeup effects of the movie and all of that there was a lot of talk about like well are we going to unmask him what's it going to look like underneath and i was like no i don't want i don't want to see jaws i want right. the sharks to stay under the water i want the audience to still be frightened because look i think one of the big mistakes honestly one of the big mistakes in in genre filmmaking, when it comes to the bit, the, 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 you know, the Mount Rushmore of horror, whether it's sure. Michael Myers, Leatherface, Jason, Pinhead, Freddy, that group of monsters. Here's the problem. By the third movie in almost every one of these franchises, we no longer care about the people that are being slaughtered. We only care about the monster. Thank you. So now the monster's the hero. And the people in the movie are fodder. We're just waiting for them Mm -hmm. to get killed, right? Which allows us to 
make the women bimbos and allows us to treat them like sex objects. It allows yep. us to treat every guy in the movie as either some sort of like, he's going to be a rapist soon or some bro yeah. dude or the nerd or the one decent guy in the movie that will let him live as long as we possibly can. Right. So we mm-hmm. put these collections of these people together and we disregard them. We don't care about those characters. And for me, that's sloppy filmmaking. Yeah. Um, when it came Following to Jason, format. Exactly. And when it came to Jason Goes to Hell, uh, I was given the format. Boy, was I. Um, and I was flat out told by Sean, uh, you know, fresh pair of boobs every seven minutes, fresh kill every seven minutes in three and a half minute increments, Adam. And I said, meh, meh. Maybe I'll give you a lot more kills than you're expecting. And I'll slaughter a lot more people, but I'm not going to do it in that, in that way. And the other thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to make it all about female nudity. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to upset the apple cart a little bit here and give the ladies as much to look at as the men. And by the way, some of the men in the room who don't want to look at the ladies, they're going to have something to look at too. So Mm -hmm. um, I wanted the movie to be for everybody. The other part is I didn't want disposable characters i wanted the heroes to be real heroes you know creighton duke is a perfect example of like i have an anti-hero in jason goes to hell Mm -hmm. you know like how many of these movies have a real von helsing not many not many right usually there's just a second bad guy well i didn't want a second bad guy i wanted a complicated town of of adults Mm -hmm. who you care about. Um, You know, you've got this hero at the center of the movie, you know, John D. LeMay does such a beautiful job as Stephen Freeman. Um, You've got this guy who's complicated, who's a fuck up, who has a baby out of wedlock and uh, and doesn't even know the baby exists, has no idea (laughs) that he's got a child in this world, you know? (gasps) And the other part of it was, I wanted Jason Goes to Hell because, you know, we kept calling it the Final Friday. Now, we all knew that they they were going to try to take the character and do something else with him, probably go up against Freddy. By the way, that's not why the ending happened the way it happened. That is not why. Um, I was never given a mandate of Freddie's got to be at the end of the movie. That was my idea. That was purely my idea at the end of the film. Um, but I knew it was the final Friday, right? They said, this is the final Friday. This is the last Friday movie we're going to make. We want to take the character elsewhere. Great. So my idea was the first movie, Friday 13th, is about a mother losing her son. It's yeah. about this woman's pain of losing her son. The final movie is the story of a father finding his daughter. Juxtaposition, man. You have the the name right there, you know, like that's brilliant. And I never thought of it that way. And that's what the movie is. So it's, it's, you know, the, the, the family unit being blown up and destroyed the family unit coming together at the end Um, and being able to defeat the evil. That that love, that the love of that is the only thing that can conquer that enormous evil. And so, um, you know, so I I really did want to make this kind of satisfying conclusion to what was one of my favorite horror series of all time. Like, I love those movies. I grew up on those films. You know, I was in the theater every opening night for every single Friday movie. Um, I, I, I adore those films. So, but I did want to take it back to the idea of, and it's part of the reason for the body hopping, I wanted Jason to be the shark under the water. No one ever roots for Jaws. They root for Mm -hmm. Chief Brody. They root for the guys on the the boat. They don't root for Jaws. And so the idea of, you know, in a very John Carpenter thing way, the idea that the villain can be anyone at any time keeps the villain under the water and it keeps the heroes Mm -hmm. as the characters you have to give a shit about. Right. And you talk about, you know, Friday the 13th being so special. The very first piece of sledgehammer horror merchandise I ever made, you know, this right here. That's that's, awesome. That's the first piece that I've ever made. Dude, it's beautiful. That's Um, beautiful. Thank you. And it's just one of those things where this, this whole franchise has such an effect on me that to this day, Anytime even a fan film gets released, I'm stoked as fuck. Like we just watched Rose Blood, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. I absolutely love it. I so good. And so, I, dude, I think it's so important that the fans are making making this stuff. I really do. I 
personally, you know, everybody keeps saying, you know, God, I hope they, fi- you know, fix this lawsuit. They can make for more Friday movies. And my response to it is really, you, you just want another reboot. You really just want, like you want Blumhouse to do this over again. Do you really, is that really right. what you want? Because for me, I go like, mm, I'm sorry. The fans are doing more interesting things than a studio is ever going to do with that character. And can we actually, can we stop beating the four horsemen of the apocalypse with a stick? Like, do we all need another Scream movie? I haven't seen the new Scream, and I've I've heard mixed things from all over the place, right? And I I hope it's awesome because I'm excited to see it. But here's the thing. At some point, we have to start making new monsters to be afraid of. Yes. You know, the, the, everything is getting really creaky. Like, how many more Chucky things are we going to see? And I love Chucky. I'm a huge Child yeah. Play fan. But I start going like, guys, when, when do we stop with this and look for some new villains? We got to start creating other franchises. Because, I'm yeah. sorry, the 1980s, we weren't going, God, how do we bring back Dracula again? Right. And th- that's what I was just going to say, you know, without Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, you know, we don't get Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger. Absolutely. But now we're still riding the coattails of that. And without Jason and Freddy, we don't get Ghostface and the right. Fisherman from I Know What You Did Last Summer. So right. now we need to build on that again and, you know, create yes. something new. Because wh- here's where I look at it. You have a studio and you have someone come to them with, hey, we got this new script for a Halloween reboot or this completely original idea, a lot of studios are going to go, well, let's go with this Halloween reboot because that's safe. And we know that we're safe with this. Right. And that awesome, creative, brand new thing gets pushed to the side and never made because they're scared of taking that risk again. So yep. this, the next Ghostbusters just went down the drain because no, and I don't mean Ghostbusters, but that next original idea, right. the, the next the next ghost thing. Yep. Does it come to fruition because they took the safe bet? Yep. I couldn't agree more, man. And it's, and for me, it's, I think we're robbing this generation of their monsters, of their nightmares, of the things, you know, look, I, I, there, and every once in a while, something punches through and then they screw it up. So, you know, we had Samara in the ring, which was terrifying that that movie is so beautifully done. Just a beautiful, beautiful movie. And then they made those sequels. And you're like, what are you guys doing? Like, you're missing Mm -hmm. the point of why that first one was great. And I got to tell you, I mean, look, you know, then you get stuff like Sinister, which I thought was badass. Like that first Sinister, I was like, okay, this is, this is awesome. This is great stuff. And the home video footage is some of the best footage in any film ever really shot on 45. Like, oh my God. Oh my God. So good. I I mean, that lawnmower scene, like I, I leapt out of my seat, you know, dude, anybody says they didn't jump at that is full of shit, man. Absolutely. So full of shit. But now they're going to do, they're going to reboot the exorcist. They're really going to do that. Like guys, you got to stop. Like somebody's got to tell these guys, like, and again, as long as people keep lining up to go see Halloween Kills, they're going to do it. They're going to mm-hmm. keep doing this, but you will get diminishing returns. And ultimately, I feel like it's a big fuck you to the fans. I really do. I feel like we better start coming up with some new nightmares, kids, because we're, we're going to, we, we are beating these characters into nothing. Well, and that's it. Eventually, um, like you said, you got Halloween ends. And by the way, I do got to say real quick, Scream 2022, very, very good. I enjoyed good. it very I'm, much. I'm excited to um, see it. I'm excited. I thought the reveal was lazy. I'm not going to spoil anything. I never spoil until right. physical media releases. Sure. But sure. Um, I thought the reveal was lazy. But besides that, it kept me entertained. It's gruesome. It's bloody. Yeah. Um, and while we're on the subject of Scream, um, we talked about your first horror movie being Rosemary's Baby and how that started you into the genre. Yeah. But my little buddy Ghostface here has a question for you, Adam. Sure. What's your favorite scary movie, Adam? What What is your favorite horror movie? We know where it started, but what's yeah. your favorite? Yeah. Um, okay. That's a little bit of a Sophie's choice for me. Okay. Um, because there's so many of them that are, that are so important to, to me and to my storytelling and to the way I see the world. 
Uh, the Exorcist is to me the still the scariest movie ever made, like hands down the scariest 100%. movie ever made. Um, and it, it its power is in the fact that you know they re released the same movie thirty years after the original release, and people and it was the number one movie of that weekend. Okay, mm-hmm. and this is after people had VHS copies of it at home. This is after DVD, and people still went and saw that movie in a theater. And people left the theater shaken. So there is something beautifully personal about that film. I think it's a remarkable movie. But I will tell you, I would be remiss if I didn't cite Jaws, which is uh, anyone who says that's not a a horror movie is a fool. Uh, Sharks do not jump up out of the water onto boats and eat the captain of the ship. Doesn't happen. So uh, that is a monster movie. Um, the Evil Dead, the original, and and Evil Dead Two, I think are are masterpieces of the genre. And I got to tell you, man, you know, there's almost nothing I'd <coughs> rather rewatch than the thing. John Carpenter's yeah. the thing is just fucking scary. It just mm-hmm. is one of the most <laughs> underrated scores of all time, too. Oh man. hell yeah, hell yeah! And I love, I love that Ennio Morricone writes that score. That literally sounds like a John Carpenter piece of music. That's my favorite thing about that, where I'm yeah. like, okay, they had so much money on that film from Universal that like they were like, well, like, John, we love your music, but I think you should really you can go top shelf with this. Like get a get a really, you know, get a big composer. And he brings on Ennio Morricone and goes, Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to only use three notes for the entire score. <laughs> You know, Ennio must have been like, wow, I have never made this much money for this little work. Um, it's kind of, right. but, the, but again, in that great John Carpenter tradition, it is understanding that less, less, less yes. is so much more. So yes. much more. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a stupid John Carpenter fan and I'm, I'm a giant fan of that movie in particular. Um, but look, let's be honest, man. The Shining is 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 perfect. It's just a perfect movie mm-hmm. um, and t- truly terrifying. Uh, I will say of modern horror films or more modern horror films, um, a movie that I don't think gets nearly its due uh, that to me has shaped a lot of the way I, I think about horror filmmaking now uh, would be uh, the original French 2007 version of Inside. Um, okay that film is so absolutely terrifying and in a increasingly um awoken society to women being important in not only in film but in horror film specifically where they had been excluded for so long uh while the direct the writers and directors of that movie are men the whole film It centers around a female hero and a female villain, and it is the most ferocious, violent, bloody, extraordinary movie. It's it's such rock star stuff. Um, And to that end, I would also note, and it's really important, um, you know, my first real cinematic crush, big time. Uh, I was in my first year of college, and I went to go see uh, by myself in a empty theater in New York City on 23rd Street. I'll never forget it. Uh, Catherine Bigelow's Near Dark, Mm. which to me is still the finest vampire movie ever made, and there's not a fang in the movie. Um, Right. And she is, uh, again, you know, she's the first woman to have ever won an Academy Award, and I still think she's incredibly underrated. Um, she is one of those filmmakers that I go like, I don't understand how people do not sing more of her praises for her early mm-hmm. work, not just for, you know, Hurt Locker and, 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 and Zero Dark Thirty, but her early stuff, she, she, she was a ferocious uh, voice the day she started, she started speaking. So, yeah. you know, those are some of my favorites. I'm sorry. I, I wish I could give you like the clear cut. This is my no. one go to, <laughs> but I can't, I, 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 I just, I don't, I don't think I work that way anymore. Like I'm so in love with film. Right. And so in well, love I mean, with genre. You just brought up one of the most scary movies I've ever seen. And it's not even a horror movie, man. Sophie's choice. Like oh, that dude. fucked me up as a kid, man. Like it 
fucked my world up. By the way, good for you, man, because here's the thing. A lot of times we don't take the real horrors of the world as horror movies. And I think that's such a giant mistake mm -hmm. because that well, horror is the hardest thing to lock down. Like you can't say it's got to have death. Bambi has death. It's right. got to be scary. Large Marge from Pee-wee's Big Adventure scared the dog scared shit the out. the crap out of everybody. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. like, don't tell me that you can nail down, oh, this is what makes a horror movie. Like, and I'm with you. I'll fight to the end. Like, Jaws, horror movie. Ghostbusters, horror movie. Sure. Like, these sure. movies to me are total. The Terminator, I feel like that's a slasher. A Absolutely. science fiction slasher movie. Absolutely. He wears a mask. He's hunting this lady by name. Goes through the phone book, killing everybody with her name. Yep. Slasher movies. You know, yep. and I hate the gatekeepers that are like, well, it's not super scary, so it's not a horror movie. Shut the uh, fuck up. Whatever. Whatever. You know, man. Like I said, Sophie's Choice, if you can watch that movie and go away from that, not traumatized in some way, sure. Sure. Do you, you need to give me therapy because you're a rock. You Dude, know, like that I could, I could not agree more, man. And look, honestly, I think anybody, anybody who treats, um, who treats, let's say, uh, subject matter like the Holocaust with any kind of reverence, with any kind of seriousness. Um, yeah, of course that's horror. Mm -hmm. Like Schindler's List has some of the scariest shit ever put on screen. 100%. You know? Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen it. Uh, have you ever seen Life is Beautiful? I have not. Uh, it's uh, Benini's, uh, Roberto Benini's film. Uh, it won the Academy Award. It won him Best Director, amazingly, uh, as an Italian. Um, and uh, it is simply a movie about a father and son who have been put into a concentration camp together. And it's about a father who is trying to make the camp livable for his child, sure. right? Trying to bring like a sense of humor into a concentration camp, which is shocking. Um, it's an amazing film. There is a shot towards the end of that movie that, people in the audience actually out loud screamed when the shot happened. Um, because again, if you treat things that, that are that horrible, that are that dark, and you treat them seriously and with reverence, uh, yeah, that's a horror movie, dude. Like, I, I, th I, love, I love it, man. I, I love that you just called Sophie's Choice a horror movie. I think that's freaking amazing. It's awesome. Oh, yeah, for it's sure. Awesome. Like I said, I, I, horror to me has always been the hardest genre to lock down. Uh, you know, comedy makes me laugh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like science yeah. fiction for me, it's got to be spacey or futuristic. Sure. Um, a drama has got to make me feel something. The horror, it can be all that wrapped into one, you know? So horror for me has always been very hard to lock down. Yeah. Um, man, I got to tell you, I could talk to you all night, but um, I do appreciate you coming on and hanging out with me, man. Dude, now, one thing I always life. end this podcast with, um, we're going to go back to uh, Rosemary's Baby, since that was your first horror movie. And what we're going to do now, Adam, is rank this on a skull count. Now, we're not being critics. We're not judging it on score, production, direction, anything like that. Sure. What we're doing is strictly judging this movie on how much it affected you on first viewing. So zero skulls being not effective, five being very effective, and you can use half and quarter skulls anywhere in the middle. What would your ranking of Sophie's Choice be? You mean of, uh, of Rosemary's Baby? Or, yeah. God, I'm still thinking about Sophie's Choice. It got me devastated. Yeah. yeah. What would your ranking of Rosemary's Baby be? Of Rosemary's Baby, it's a definite five. It's an absolute sure. five. Absolute five. Um, it, it, it affected me entirely. Like there's, there's, and quite frankly, I don't know if there's a day that goes by that it doesn't come into my thoughts at some point in the day. Um, it's, it's traumatic, man. And mm -hmm. one of the craziest endings of any horror movie of all time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and it's also, it's, you know, there, there's something about the banality of evil. There's something about that, the, the, the idea that like, it's just a bunch of elderly folks who live in a brownstone in New York who, um, you know, they're just conjuring the devil. No big whoop. <laughs> right. There's something. So, it's so funny because we think we think of, you know, evil, um, especially stuff that's related to the devil as like bigger and, you know, sort of Bill and Ted's bogus journey, which I always think like nails that that goth metal sort of idea of of, sure. of, of hell. Uh, to me, there's something much worse about your next door neighbor is mm -hmm. the devil. That the person that you trust and that you talk with and that, you know, seems so normal. It's that idea of like, you know, every, every time somebody has, lives next door to a serial killer and they interview them, God, he seemed so normal. He was a little quiet, kept to himself, but so normal. We had cookouts with each other, man. Right, right. That's scary.
And yes. Rosemary's Baby did that before anybody was talking about that. Look, let's be honest. You know, you're also talking about a filmmaker. Um, you know, we, we were talking about the Holocaust, but, you know, Roman Polanski uh, grew up in Auschwitz. Mm-hmm. He grew up in a concentration camp. That's the beginning of his life was in a concentration camp. Um, can, can you think of anything more scary? I can't. You know? I can't. Like, no, no. And and you uh, you you pour that sense of paranoia. And he made three three films that are all remarkable, and they're part of a trilogy. Rosemary's Baby is the middle film, actually. But Repulsion, which is Catherine Deneuve's first movie, that's that's Polanski's uh, big break into mm-hmm. uh, uh, narrative features. Um, he'd already done Cul de Sac and uh, Knife in the Water, but but Repulsion was a big big stepping stone for him. Repulsion, Rosemary's Baby, and The Tenant, which okay. he, by the way, if you've never seen The Tenant, I couldn't recommend it more. It's an unbelievable film. Roman Polanski not only directed the movie, he's the star of the film. Oh, nice. And he's brilliant. He gives an unbelievable performance. Um, that, and there's a great movie called A Pure Formality, him and Gerard Depardieu. They're the only two characters, well, they're the two lead characters of the movie. You should see both those films. They're incredible. Uh, okay. But You know, there's a sense of paranoia and a sense of not trusting the person on either side of you that permeates Polanski's work. Um, And it's it's why that film is so still to this day so effective. It's a great film. Right. And, you know, they've tried to remake it and it's fallen flat on its face. This is just another one of those movies that, you know, it's like Jaws. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Do it again. Yeah. I should have said this off the top, guys, but we're at the third act now. The credits are about to roll, so I'm going to let you know now. I have all of Adam's social media links down here in the description, so make sure you're following him so you don't have to wait for me to give updates about him. You can have your updates right down here from the horse's mouth on everything that he's doing in the future. Um, Adam, like I said, don't go anywhere. i got a couple more questions for you. Everybody else, as always, keep talking horror, stay what you are, and we'll see you guys soon.